morning. My name is Adam Shoemaker, and I'm rector here at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It is a joy to welcome you to worship on this, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. As we uh, enter into worship today, I do want to note that very shortly we will be uh, delivering a care package to every Buddy, on our rolls, we have teams of parishioners who will be doing this, so please be on the lookout for that care package uh, that should be coming, that has a whole bunch of goodies in it uh, to help you uh, prepare for um, Thanksgiving and Advent and even, uh, even Epiphany uh, for the coming months in our church calendar. We do continue our fall pledge campaign. Uh, and our stewardship testimonials. And so I will now turn things over to uh, the Monahan family to talk about what St. Stephen's means in their life and why they invest in our mission and ministry. Hello. Hi, St. Stephen's. We're the Monahan family. I'm Claire. I'm, I'm Rose. I'm Mia. And I'm James. And we've been asked to uh, talk for a minute about what St. Stephen's means for us. And the shortest answer, I guess, is that yeah, it's, the no. is it's, that it's home. Me. That's right. And, uh, and when, I love to Sunday school and play with all the kids. That's right, too. When we joined right after Rose here was born, and we had a big list of places to go and churches to check out, and to see which ones we liked the most. And we went to St. Stephen's first, and we didn't go to any other one. Because immediately we were... I don't know where it is, Rena. Oh, here it is. Immediately we were welcomed with open arms and told that... We could stay. We could stay. And I remember Rena, Rose here was an infant, and we were passing her up and down the aisle. Everybody wanted to hold her. So we knew immediately that we were home. And for us... As our family has grown, we have loved seeing St. Stephen's grow, and that's why we decided to pledge to St. Stephen's, is we want to continue to see that growth happen, because for us, that home is seeing how we want our children to learn from the church and the people from the church. And our church is an incredible place. And it's, a, it's an example of the world we want to live in. Even if sometimes it's quiet. Okay, it'll be quiet. We love you all, and we're so happy to be part of the St. Stephen's community. And we can't wait to see you all in person. But until then, we're going to continue to do what we can to make sure that St. Stephen's stays thriving and moving And we love you so much. much. So much. Bye-bye. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson comes from Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sierra, who lived in Harosha Hagawin. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lipidah, was judging Israel. She used to sit on the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abidaram, from Kadesh to Naphtha, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtha and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sierra, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kizim, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To you I lift up mine eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of a servant look to the hand of their master, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look 
walked the Lord our God until he shows us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Too much the scorn of the indolent rich and the derision of the proud. The second lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For when they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be as when a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the God who loves us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Nearly half of all the parables that Jesus tells in the Gospels pertain to money or commerce. But in many cases, money is merely the presenting issue. The real focus is how to live an abundant life, how to live in such a way that we help to build up God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the focus, in my mind, of the so-called parable of the talents that we just heard read from the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. A parable that Jesus tells that describes a wealthy landowner who leaves talents, money, to three of his slaves and then goes off on a long journey. When he returns, he lauds the first two slaves for multiplying his wealth, but criticizes and casts out the third slave for bearing his talent in the ground. I believe this parable is a good example of why we mustn't read the parables of Jesus literally. I also believe that this parable should caution us to read the parables of Jesus allegorically. For in my mind, the master in this story simply cannot stand in for God. The mistreatment of the third slave here is just not in keeping with the God of love that we have come to know in Jesus. But I do believe it is noteworthy to pay attention to why the third slave chooses to bury his talent in the ground. We're told that he chooses to do this out of fear, out of his fear of the master. He is paralyzed with fear. And by the time the story ends, we see that his fears are well-founded. But if we step back and consider the spiritual life, I bet we could all agree that fear can paralyze any of us, can diminish any of us, can prevent any of us from being the beloved people that we are called to be in this world. Fear of God can do this. Fear of neighbor can do this especially our neighbor who is different than us, who comes from a different place than we do, who believes something differently than we do, who even votes differently than we do. We are now more than a week out from our elections in this country. And whatever your political party, whomever you voted for, whatever you feel about the election results, we remain a deeply divided, deeply polarized nation. And those divisions are tearing our country apart, tearing communities apart, tearing families apart. And I believe these divisions call us to redouble our efforts as followers of Jesus, as men and women who make up the church, the body of Christ in the world, to strive to be reconcilers. For at the end of the day, reconciliation is the mission of the church. St. Paul says as much in his letters to the church in Corinth. Our prayer book, Catechism, says it as well at the end of the Book of Common Prayer on page 855. When we are told that the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Reconciliation. But often our fears can get in the way. Our fears of our neighbor, our fears of conflict, our fears of being put in uncomfortable and challenging situations. Now, sometimes those fears are well-founded. Sometimes those fears are of our own making. But fear can paralyze us from doing the good work that we've been called to do, which in my mind is why one of the most ubiquitous of phrases in the Bible, in both the Old and New Testaments, is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We must not be afraid to step forward in faith and continue to strive for reconciliation in this world. But make no mistake about it, reconciliation is hard work. 
if we take it seriously. You know, before I say a few things about what that work looks like, I want to say a few things about what I do not believe reconciliation entails. I recently heard someone say one cannot reconcile with their abusers, and I believe that that is well said. For reconciliation does not mean that we allow abuse, injustice, or wrongdoing to go on unchecked. It does not mean that we put ourselves or anyone else in unhealthy or harmful situations. It does not mean that we paper over truths or turn a blind eye to real differences to achieve a false peace. No, reconciliation requires that we be willing to be brutally honest with one another. Reconciliation requires that we speak the truth in love, that we create spaces, and hopefully the church is just such a space, where people can be brave together, where different people can come together and speak their truth without fear of being immediately judged or dismissed out of hand. Reconciliation requires that we continue to strive to reach out to one another in love, to build relationships, to build community, to build pathways of understanding. Last week, I quoted Bishop Rob Wright, the Bishop of the Diocese of Atlanta, a bishop whom I admired greatly for his ability to speak the truth in love on a variety of thorny issues. Well, shortly after our election results were made known, Bishop Wright issued a list of nine things that we could do to heal the nation. And this list has begun to be shared across the church. And so I'd like to share this list with you now. First, he says, we can pray for the nation, for President Trump and President-elect Biden. We can be kind in speech and actions, especially with those whom we disagree. We can grant Jesus' request to pray for our enemies and bless those that curse us. We can use our social media platforms only for positive, non-aggressive, encouraging, and constructive purposes. We can refuse to pass along information as truth that does not bear the mark of good scholarship and fairness. We can reflect on and relinquish our need to feel and behave as superior to other members of the American family. We can schedule a conversation with a family member or coworker who sees the world differently and be curious rather than defensive or combative. We can accept responsibility for making the country and the world better, kinder, healthier, safer, cleaner, and more just. And finally, we can commit for three years to an organization whose purpose is to bring equity to the American family. Now there are some things on Bishop Wright's list that might be easier for you to do than others. I'm sure there are some things that might make you uneasy, uncomfortable, maybe even afraid. But I would invite you, I would challenge you, to at least strive to do a couple of things on that list for the sake of our American family, for the sake of our call to be reconcilers in this fractured and divided world, a world in many respects described by the parable that Jesus tells us today, a world where we are made to believe that life is a zero-sum game, where people in power often pit us against one another. We are called, amidst that very real world, to continue to work for reconciliation, to continue to believe that reconciliation is possible, and to believe that we can make a difference, that our words, that our actions, 
that our behavior matters. It's not just up to our elected leaders to bring about reconciliation. And as Christians, that is a core part of our mission. That is a core part of what it means to let our light shine, to help to build up God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So may we be unafraid to do just that. May we be, for Christ's sake, reconcilers. May we go out into this world and incarnate the love of Jesus so that we can help God to shine a bright light to illuminate the darkness around us. In the name of the God who loves us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me now in affirming our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People In the silence following each petition, I invite your prayers, either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Bishop Curry and Bishop Parsley, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. We pray for St. Thomas in North Charleston. We pray for the church in Ceylon. We also pray for the Diocesan Standing Committee, Diocesan Staff, and the Bishop Search Committee. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. We pray for President Trump, Vice President Pence, and all those holding elected office. We pray for President-elect Joe Biden, President-elect Harris, and all those who will assume elected office in January. We also pray for our nation's voting process and a peaceful transition of power in the coming months. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray for all those infected by the coronavirus, all those experiencing racial injustice, and all those caring for the sick. We pray for all those who are in financial distress during this time. We pray for the lonely. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed especially remember, remembering Leroy Lawrence, Pauline Ellerton, and Miriam Joan Coyne. Pray for those who have died. 
I ask your prayers for the following. Angela Smith, Mary Lou Thompson, Amy Limehouse, Rose Adams, Jill Sinclair, Mary Burkett, Peg Gum, Fred Pittman, Joe Frazier, Herbert Drayton Jr., Bill Marie, Michael Burkett, Jan Roberson, Susan Van Team Sockley, Carolyn Rouse, Ms. Bobby. We pray for those serving our country, including Malik Spruill, Tyrese Watson, Letitia Watson Franks, Edward Pritchard, Herbert Jordan Drayton, Nicholas Loving, and Ryan Savage. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O God, the Father of all, whose Son commanded us to love our enemies, lead them and us from prejudice to truth. Deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And in your good time, enable us all to stand reconciled before you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you now to share the peace with a member of your household or to send a text to a friend. Let us now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also and with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, and forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore, let let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah, and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, 
and of the Holy Spirit who broods over the world as a mother for her children be upon you and remain with you forever. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 